Now, I'm going to start off with a question that I have for Matt, because I actually Googled polar geodesy, because I thought I better get become an expert, uh, and his name just came up. So I got He no just made there. up the name then. <laughs> So please tell me, what is polar geodesy? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and do we have only 40 minutes? <laughs> um, no, so, so geodesy is, is, a, is a, an old science. In fact, it's an ancient science. It's, it's the study of the shape of the Earth, uh, the, how the Earth rotates, its gravity field, and how those things change over time. Uh, and by studying those things, we can uh, study sea level change and the ice sheets and how they're changing. Uh, and so I do that with a polar focus. Okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> I also have a question for you, Mikey. You've got a young family and you work with a lot of young adults uh, at the university. How can we, and I'm sure lots of parents here are wondering this question, how can we talk to young people about climate change when they have all uh, this fake news bombarded at them? How do we help them with wisdom to really sort through the information that's being thrown at them? Yeah, well, it's it's some ways it's using something that Christians, especially in, in my tradition, the kind of reformed kind of tradition, has had a focus on in a different context, the kind of uh, discerning worldview, analysing, worrying over, not just accepting everything you're told. It's using that stuff which can be rightly applied to a worldly worldview or a questionable theological framework. It's using those same tools and applying those then to actually all the media that's being thrown our way. So in some ways that was done, those working with uni students on campuses in the past would do that. We'd look at a newspaper article that, you know, an evening news broadcast, they're the only times news came, once a, once a day, you know, <laughs> maybe twice a day. And you could analyse that news and, and teach people to be discerning about how news came to them. It's now obviously coming all the time and from many, many sources. Um, who may not be that responsible, and, and even our news resources are under pressure, and so they're not necessarily presenting the best reporting always either. And so it's using those same tools, discernment really, but just saying discernment doesn't mean just disagreeing with whatever the, the non-Christian says. Sometimes it's filtering that stuff, and, and, I, and so we, we've started to do that more, and to say here's how you assess a website or a Facebook post or a, an opinion piece and actually assess that um, discerningly as a Christian. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks, mm. Mikey. We have a question from Will in Hobart for Matt. He says, what have you seen with your own eyes that has convinced you of the importance of addressing the crisis? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So, look, um, uh, so I've, I've had the, 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 the good privilege and blessing to go to Antarctica and Greenland and Iceland and um, certain in Antarctica, I, the parts of Antarctica I was visiting were uh, unchanged for thousands of years and you got that feeling that you were standing in a place that hadn't felt the fingerprints of humanity on it in any way, shape or form or, or even the boot steps uh, on it in some cases. Um, when you go to Greenland and, and Iceland, it's a very different thing. You can see in the landscape um, change that's actually quite recent. And, and actually, we have um, aerial photographs going back uh, 100 years in both of those places where you can actually see the retreats of the glaciers in very visual form. Um, and it's shocking because you can stand there even in a sort of tourist spot and look and see the photograph of where the glacier was in 1926 and where it is now, and it's way up there. Uh, and it's, it's not one glacier, it's not two glaciers, it's, it's, it's uh, the vast swathe of the glaciers. And so the very uh, telling records of the change that's underway. Um, and, you know, we, we, we know intuitively when, when you heat up uh, uh, ice, it melts. And so, this, the, the, you know, we can make that connection to climate change really quickly through the glaciers. Yeah. We have a question here that I'm going to start with you, Mikey. It says, does the Bible have anything to say about climate science? No, not directly, no. Um, but it, it does speak about human beings as God's appointed rulers over the world. And, uh, and that's an enormous responsibility. Uh, it's not a, one, a reckless one that we use it simply for human interests alone or human convenience alone. But to, as the image of God, rule the world responsibly means we need to be attentive as we become 
you know, I mean, Adam names the animals. He becomes familiar with the animals um, in, in Eden, as um, Genesis 2 describes. We want to, as we name more and more things, I, I think many theologians see the naming of the animals as the beginning of that. It goes into Solomon, who then names the plants that crawl up the wall and all the proverbs. And, and so I think an extension of that Eden project um, about how we wisely rule over the world, we, we shouldn't be a despot who sits in some palace while our nation, the planet, is in ruins, uh, like Scar and the Lion King. <laughs> but we should rule the world responsibly. I think that's the line I'd kind of take. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so um, I, think, I, think, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think there's another angle in that, you know, the, 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 one of the, the cores of the Christian belief is this idea that in, that in rejecting God, we've, you know, humanity has gone to the, is going to the depths of where human, you could imagine humanity could go to. Um, and, um, and that has, as Mikey talked about in his talk, that has that is far global consequences. Um, and so you would expect that, um, you know, some people have said, I've seen US senators say, you know, it, it couldn't be that humanity could actually uh, uh, impact the global climate because that's, that's somehow God's domain. Um, but I think a right thinking in terms of Christian thinking is that actually nothing's really without, outside of that realm of, of humans' negative impact as we go about stewarding the world in, in a negative way, as we badly steward the world. Um, and so I personally think that Christians should... should you know, we, don't, we don't see climate change science in the Bible... But I don't think we should be surprised that it happens at all. I don't know what the first readers and hearers of the book of Revelation understood it to mean, but there is a verse in Revelation 11 that speaks of God bringing judgment, destroying those who destroy the earth, which is a striking uh, verse. has a whole other resonance now. Yeah. Thank you for that. We have a question here for Matt that says, what does net zero emissions actually mean? Yeah, so that's a that's a, a good question. So it basically means that um, uh, well, one way of viewing net zero emissions is that you don't emit anything. Um, that would be zero human emissions into the atmosphere. Um, but you, you, there are uh, ways of soaking up um, uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, planting forests, things like that. Uh, trees grow; they soak up carbon dioxide. So you can be offsetting some of the emissions. So you can still emit some into the atmosphere because it comes back out of the atmosphere. Um, so that's what it's talking about. It's talking purely about the human uh, carbon emissions side of things. The natural system has been in fantastic balance for uh, thousands of years um, and it will continue to do its thing. And as I said, it's been helping us out. Um, but humanity has to get itself where it's balanced. Yeah, that's really helpful. Here's one that I think will strike some interesting conversation. It says, hope and despair... How do we choose when we hear what Matt spoke about? I'll start with you, Mikey. Just a bit of that question, I see. How do we choose between hope and despair uh. when we hear about what Matt shared? Yeah, that was what I was trying to explore. Yeah, I, so I think I, I, it's a, an artist's flourish in the film quote that says you hold together hope and despair together. You know, that, that's a poetic way of describing, in a sense, in that quote, despair means, you know, grim, fearful, pessimism of a sort, yeah. So I don't think ultimately a Christian is given way to despair, properly speaking, but may well, as on a, on a very small level, anybody who's known anybody who's received that terrible phone call from a doctor about a certain prognosis um, has to then look into it and ask, what does it mean to live with that, um, you know, like a much shorter life? than I thought I'd have. Yeah, that not all people who get that phone call then give in to despair, even though there is now a grim pessimism for their life, but actually, you know, they actually then, many can testify to even having hope in the midst of that. Yeah, and so that's what we all look for. Yeah, and I think the, the, um, the, the, the right response still at this point of time is alarm and concern. But I don't think it is, humanly speaking, despair. Uh, I think the best of the climate communicators, uh, those scientists who are talking about climate science with the public on a regular basis, are still talking about hope. And they're not doing that in a, in a way that's just fooling us. Um, but, the, you know, there is still time to get this sorted. Um, there is time in the next two decades. But, but, it, but it's, it's, it's urgency. It's a call to arms. 
we have to get going. We, there's no more time for um, messing around. We, you know, we need to do... We ha every day counts from here to, you know, over the next decades. That alarm would work, it just says, yeah. Through one to you, Mikey. Why should Christians be concerned about climate change? Because we're in charge of ruling God's world, we should be concerned about anything that tells us we're not doing that well and repent of things that, uh, that are out of gross self-interest uh, causing destructive harm. Uh, but also, Matt really helpfully showed us the humanitarian concern as well. So if you won't care about your responsibility for the glaciers um, and so forth, then show your concern for the world's poorest. Love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus said. Um, so the whole law and the prophets hang on that, he said. So even if it's just a humanitarian, I don't think it's only humanitarian. Um, and heck, we could even go one step further, couldn't we, and say that in the end it'll be economically disastrous for you. So it's bad business, it's bad finance. So even if that's all we can appeal to you on. And that's starting to become an issue with some as well, yeah? Yeah, no, no I mean, certainly the, the economists in the last decade or so have been, well, not all economists, of course, um, uh, but... Um, but a, 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 you know, a growing fraction are saying actually the cost of not acting is going to be much, much worse than acting. Um, both of them have real costs uh, to the economy, um, but actually the, the better choice is the one that actually results in a uh, uh, greater chance of human flourishing and, uh, and our descendants actually having a, uh, an environment that we would like them to have. My little book um, wrestles with ethics and eschatology, end times. What did you think about the end times, the end of the world and stuff, life after death? And one of the big points in that book, and in good, healthy Christian theology, is to say that eschatology doesn't erase ethics. And so a famous quote that Martin Luther may or may not have actually said is, um, even if I knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, I'd still plant a tree today. Now, that's a saying that captures the sense of there's still ethical duties today that God's given me to do today, and it's not for me to say, ah, Jesus come back for tomorrow, so you know, I don't need... I could suspend ethics. There's a question that uh, flows on from that oh. that says, Mikey, I want hope now. How can I have hope now? Jesus came in order to uh, not just speak about hope, but actually to bring hope, not in the sense of I wish or maybe, but in the sense of a short prospect. So a Christian uses hope in that sense of something I anticipate for sure. It's just not yet. Yeah, so in Jesus, we see a death for the forgiveness of the world and reconciliation with God and a risen life anew as a beginning of a new life for humanity and the world. And his message was, follow me. Turn away from your rejection of God. Turn, follow me. And in me, you'll have life, forgiveness, hope forever. Thank you for that. Matt, uh, this question asks, please comment on the assertion that global warming caused by human activity is negligible compared to that caused by natural causes, for example, volcanoes. Yeah, so that's, that's a really common myth. And um, it, to be honest, if you read the Australian newspaper, you would have read that type of thing uh, quite a lot. Um, it, it's entirely a myth. You know, that, for example, it's often said that volcanoes emit many times um, what human, humans emit on a, an annual basis. That is just blatantly and falsely, uh, f uh, blatantly untrue. Um, uh, volcanoes emit something like 0.2% of what humans emit every year. Um, it's just, a, it's, a, it's almost negligible. Uh, and of course, the world has uh, uh, been having volcanic eruptions and soaking up that carbon dioxide uh, for, for thousands of years. And so that's just part of the natural system. There's, there's bumps and peaks in the natural cycle. But humans are, are driving a major new experiment since the Industrial Revolution, and especially over the last 60 years. You've heard it right here, folks. Fake news. <laughs> mm. So, Matt, what can we as individuals actually do to help with slowing, the slowing down of climate change from an individual level? Yeah, so, so the first thing I, I, I say here is perhaps will surprise you. The first and most powerful thing that you can do to uh, work, help with climate change is to talk about climate change. Um, to put it on the agenda amongst your family, amongst your friends, in your workplaces when you go to work tomorrow or study tomorrow, whatever you do, whoever you speak to on the phone, tell, talk to them about tonight. Um, that, that actually uh, helps other people have the confidence to actually think, actually, this is an issue that 
that actually is concerning and we need to think about and, and do something about. Uh, and so that's the number one thing, is to talk about climate change. Um, and the second thing is, is, is you know, the range of very localised um, actions you can, you can do. You can um, think about, can I actually catch a bit more public transport or work, walk to work, um, as, as some of us can do? Um, you know, are solar panels actually within my reach? Can I join the very large number of Australians with solar panels on their roof? Or can I begin planning for that over the next few years financially? Um, can I, can I um, uh, do a little bit more recycling? You know, that's sort of the basic level stuff. Um, can I get my kids to actually catch the bus to school rather than dropping them off um, at school? Um, and, um, and thirdly, there's right to your politician. Um, uh, especially if you voted for them and they're elected, um, because uh, they listen to people who vote for them. Uh, and we're told uh, constantly that actually the amount of communication they receive about these issues is something that they respond to. Uh, and so uh, a mini avalanche of letters going into your local politician and telling them, I voted for you, but I, I want to see greater action on climate change um, for our kids' sake or, or whatever, that, that I think can have an important impact. That's really helpful. Uh, this next question is for both of you. How might we change church cultures so that climate justice and caring for God's creation are seen as a necessary part of being a faithful disciple of Jesus? Do you want to start, Mikey? Yeah, culture change is a, is a long, slow thing. And, and so it, it, leaders play a part in that. And uh, in some ways, on one level, this is a to choose to host this topic, which I suspect amongst some of their stakeholders and supporters will be controversial for City Bible Forum, was an act of leadership, so we, um, we the panel, applaud City Bible Forum um, uh, for doing that. So, so there's things like that. Um, there's, there's the grassroots level stuff. I mean, part of it is actually, um, oh, do I have anything else to say? Am I just waffling because I'm a preacher? Let me start there, Tag. And I can hear oh. what you have to say as well, actually, Ella. Yeah. That was a... Very bad uh, hospital yeah. pass, Mike. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. So, look, I think the, the similar... Simil I, I don't know if organisationally is the right way to go at it. So thinking, OK, the leaders of the church need yeah. to actually activate their people on climate change. I think, you know, as we go about life with one another as Christians, well, we're going to be talking about the things that matter to us, you know, and there's going to be uh, spiritual things we talk about. There's going to be, um, you know, going to work and there's going to be climate change and we're going to be talking about that. And we're going to be thinking together... Well, what should we be doing, you know, individually, or maybe what should we be doing together that actually can help contribute to this, to you know, to show that we're actually uh, taking this seriously as we should do. So I, I guess that's where I'd come come at it from. Alan. Yeah, that's great. I will take up Mikey's mantle and share a couple of thoughts that I had. Uh, both of you are absolutely correct. From a leadership level, absolutely, uh, but also having those conversations. So you talked about the individual sort of uh, impact that you can have. Having conversations, having conversations are so powerful in, you know, churches have small groups, have those conversations, ask the question, so what do you think about climate change? And that might be difficult, it might be challenging for some, but I think that that just opens up those conversations. And as Mikey said, culture change is always very slow, um, but it, it, you've got to start somewhere um, because it happens. Culture does change and it just starts with the conversations, really. I'm just, I'm, you're buying time by getting you guys to talk as well. Uh, I suppose part of what culture changes also through habits and routines and normal shift and, and artefacts and patterns, all these things. Culture's not just words, is it, or just leaders. Um, and so I guess there's a whole bunch of things that become normals and acceptable normals um, and, and possible futures. I guess that kind of imagination of what's a desirable way to live and future and things to value. And so I guess there... You know, because it's more than, in some ways, it's more than just recycling or catching the transport, is it? But it's also, how do I make decisions about who I vote for in a multifaceted way rather than a one-issue way? Or um, how do I be someone who just feels a generalised sense of responsibility as a global citizen? Things like that. And I think some of those things come down to how we pray in our prayer newsletters, um, the kind of holidays we take. Oh, there's a whole bunch of little things, I guess, that have become the habits and routines of life that makes things imaginable. Yeah. That's really great. Mm. Uh, Matt, why is it that it's mostly Christians who are leading the fight against measures to try and stop human-caused climate change? 
Oh, look, look, I, I, I will um, blame Christians in part, but I wouldn't say that they're mainly uh, uh, involved. I don't know how many people on the board of Exxon in 1988 were Christians. I suspect there were a bunch of people who weren't Christians or, you know, other religions. Um, uh, so, look, I, I don't think so. In Australia, we've had a, a, a number of, it would be true, a number of prominent Christians, you know, particularly in uh, political life and, uh, and uh, associated lobby groups. Um, and look, I th- look, I, I'd be interested in what I've heard other people think. I think there's a there's a um, a, a general conservatism uh, towards life to change. Uh, there's a conservatism towards big government, and so anything that looks like government needing to reach its long arm out and impose taxes and things like that, we don't like. Um, I think many uh, of those Christians in leadership positions are, are very safely in the middle class, and we've got shares and we've got vested interests in. Um, uh, organisations, and it's also true that um, uh, you know the Australian Minerals Council is one of the largest lobby organisations in Canberra, and has been in their ear for a long time, uh, telling them about jobs. You know, and we care about jobs; we care about people, so we we want them to have employment. Uh, and so there's a bunch of uh, complicated issues behind this. Um, I, I don't think we're going to unpick that entirely. We have to actually move to a new way of thinking and go, actually, we've moved beyond that phase now to a point where we actually realise that actually we need to um, take some serious action and quickly. Yeah, yeah that's good insight. Uh, we have another one for you, Matt. How can we counter the extreme scepticism and the distrust of scientists when the evidence is so convincing? Yeah, look, uh, w- look, one of the reasons why I was glad that this event was on and I was, you know, happy to accept is that I think you need to have trusted voices in any conversation, yeah, so, so um, and, and even though I haven't met um, most of the people on the uh, live stream, I dare say, and uh, uh, some of the people in this, in, in Hobart here, um, I hope that I can, in, in coming from a very similar place to some of the Christians, um, uh, that I can come as somewhat a trusted voice, that I come from the same worldview. There's a, there's a well-known climate scientist in the US called Catherine Hayhoe, uh, who's a Christian, from, she's from, the, uh, from Canada originally, but uh, works in the South in Texas. Uh, and she, she actually, um, her bread and butter climate communication is going from church group to church group and actually saying, look, I'm a, I'm a Christian just like you. Um, this is what I can tell you about climate science. And actually, the, the, it's incredibly winsome. Uh, and so having trusted voices is actually really important. You go, actually, uh, I can see someone who's, who thinks about the world just like me, um, and yet uh, they're saying, based on their expert knowledge, that actually climate change is happening and it's being driven by humans and it's, and it's dangerous, but there's something we can do about it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, here's one for you, Mikey. Is this approach that you're describing not simple apathy smuggled under the guise of hope? No. (laughs) I was saying that hope actually can enable us, can potentially give us the resources to face a grim future rather than want to hide from it. Um, And within then that emotional strength that hope gives you then enable you to to act. That's uh, an activism driven by some longer-term security. It's not... uh, Yeah, so that's what I was trying to get at. I mean... I think we could add to other reasons. There's a bunch, there's a mess of theological things that are wonderful truths in scripture that can be weaponized by being out of whack. Jesus is going to come back and make everything new, therefore who cares about this world is one of those. Um, where, to, where to rule the world, therefore anything that suggests that humans uh, do it badly is somehow misanthropic and anti, you know, anti-human or something like this. Um, uh, yeah, the big government thing. So, you know, God gives a restraint on human governments. Government, there's more to life than government. Um, therefore, any massive problem that can primarily needs to be addressed by large government mechanisms is therefore, in it, you know, necessarily Orwellian or something like this. So there's a bu- bunch of those um, things that we need to kind of face by actually reading our Bibles more carefully and having a, a, a cyclical sort of spiral approach to Scripture where we look at Scripture and look at our world, look at Scripture again and realise maybe we hadn't fully understood its implications and then look back. And, and that cycling in means that we might see new things that we hadn't seen as, as clearly before. And so, um, yeah, so even that discernment thing I was discussing before, um, being trained in discernment can actually equip Christians to be 
conspiracy theorists because we're already, in a sense, aware of the devil's conspiracy. Do you see what I mean? And so we can be primed to lean that way. And, and I suspect probably differing views on creation and evolution is another a whole other topic. But if you've already think that science has got it wrong there, then, yeah, you put up a graph that t talks in tens or hundreds, thousands, millions of years, then suddenly you've stopped listening. So there's, there's a bunch of these other things we've got to do work on, I think. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Uh, this one's for both of you. I fear the issue amongst most, most humans, including Christians, is not despair or, or rage, but apathy. How do we overcome this human condition? Wow, okay, yeah, but I, look, I, I think that is the danger. I think, you know, the reason why have we had not seen profound uh, action, you know, weekly um, uh, protests of a million people in, in the big cities in Australia, why aren't we seeing that? We have seen that, you know, at different uh, epochs in, in the last decades. Um, um, look, people, people are understanding, understandably wanting to, to live their lives and, and um, I guess have finite energy to... T to, to maintain the momentum, you know, unless that's your thing, you know, it's hard to get up out of bed every day and go, well, I'm going to be passionate about climate change yet again, despite the fact that, you know, not much seems to be happening in the political uh, uh, system, for instance. So, uh, but, but I think, um, I think that that's why when we talk about hope, we talk about the things that are happening. Um, we, we talk about the things that actually are going to, ha that, that will eventually happen, that there's a, there's a freight train that's just getting up to speed, uh, now and actually we don't want to be get left, left behind on that because there is action that's occurring, there is more action coming down the pipeline. Do we want to be late adopters or early adopters? I think we want to be early adopters. Uh, there's much to be gained by being an early adopter of, uh, of some of the change. And so I, so I think that actually, you know, seeing that there's, there's something coming is, is somewhere um, uh, towards that answer, but I am, I think, waffling as well, so hopefully I've brought my... It's a killer, time. isn't it? Yeah, no, thank you. Right. Yeah. Look, I mean, partly the apathy is understandable because there is, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, there's a limit to what you could do mm. and what I could do, actually. And so you're right in being apathetic. It's not up to you. Uh, but you could be someone who works hard at your uni and works hard at your career and ends up becoming someone who could do something. Or homeschool so diligently that you raise kids who excel during their university years and go on to be someone who does something. <laughs> do, do you see what I mean? And so, so I guess sometimes individual apathy, uh, the instinct to be an individual activist, either in marches or in personally being the change you want to see in the world, that's one way of acting, but in a sense doesn't bring about the change. It feels great and it does play a part, um, but actually in a weird way, our church community is raising up a few key science leaders, government leaders, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, you know, aid workers in some, you know, sacrificial aid workers willing to go to the, the front lines of, of sea level rise or whatever. Um, it may be a whole community that raises a few people that make a disproportionate influence. So I guess that's a, a long view thought as well, your individual sense of disempowerment can be separated from your contribution to a larger impact. Yeah, that's really helpful. So this next question uh, transitions to sustainability for you, Matt. Uh, your thoughts on global and personal limits. Are we simply changing addiction from hydrocarbons to other forms of energy? Um, look, I, I think it's probably... Uh, um, slightly fantastical to assume that Western society is going to, you know, completely divorce itself from energy use of any kind. Um, uh, I, I think there is a promise of actually um, pretty good, uh, you know, reliable, large-scale sources of clean energy. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've become a sh used to, to, you know, burning stuff to get, to get fuel, um, and that... Uh, going up into the atmosphere in some ways. But actually, there's an opportunity right now to rethink that entirely and actually think that actually we can produce a, a, a very large amount of energy in a clean way. We won't be able to produce an infinite amount of energy, like we're not going to put solar panels over all of Australia. <laughs> um, that would have profound impacts on the ecosystem as well, um, uh, not to mention, you know, where we live. Um, but but I, think, I, I think there's nothing wrong with having energy. Energy is good. Um, we just don't, now that we know that the energy that we've been using has generally been very bad for the, the world's climate, um, we need to move off into cleaner forms of energy. We do need to think about whether we need to use as much energy as we do. 
I think it's always good to re reflect on that. You know, am I using the resources that I have wisely um, and in the best way I can, given that other people might need those resources more than me? So I think that's a good thing to think about. Yeah, that's really great. As we uh, head into our final few minutes, I just wanted to get both of your final thoughts on the topic, uh, but there's also a question here uh, for both of you. Firstly, Matt, do you have any recommendations as to where we can go and get re reliable, up-to-date information on climate change? And yourself, Mikey, is there any helpful environmental theology as well? Yeah, so look, the one resource I would go to, if you've still got questions about climate change especially, you're a little bit sceptical still, I would go, I would Google sceptical science, uh, scepticalscience.com. Uh, it's a great resource of um, uh, layperson's understanding of uh, a lot of the um, objections to climate science and, and so everything from simple to uh, advanced answers to a lot of those concerns. Um, it's a tremendous resource. There, you can go to the front page at scepticalscience.com and there's a, you know, begin here button and you can start your journey um, into climate change. That's where I'd go to to start with. Um, actually, I, I haven't read deeply in the theological, e environmentalist sort of literature and, and so I can't sort of give the strong recommends on that. I guess one of the things that I would want to convey to you rather than needing to read specialised books is to actually go back and read the Bible. If this is a Christian asking the question or even not, go back and read the Bible yourself with this sort of stuff in mind and let God's word speak to you afresh and be confident that he has because I know he has to me so I haven't needed some other environmentalist theologian to tell me something. I, I've kept coming back to God's word and seeing how it speaks to these issues today, you know, illuminated by his, his spirit. There's a, a weird movie called Noah by Darren Aronofsky that portrays two views of the image of God. There's Tubal Cain's view of the image of God, which is God made man in his image, let him rule and he's killing the earth. And then there's Noah and his family's view of the image of God. God made man and woman in his image. Let him rule and care and tend and nurture. And that's just a great example of how the Bible handled and understood rightly actually speaks. It can be twisted, but can also speak really well on these things. So uh, I certainly can testify to the fact that, that God's word is, is, a, is a fountain of great stuff uh, to come back and look at afresh. Well, thank you so much, Matt and Mikey. This has been an outstanding, dis outstanding discussion on climate change and hope. So as they head off, let's give them a big round of applause.